You're listening to a 58 Ember production. G I R L S C A M P S Girls Camp. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Girls Camp podcast. I'm your host, Haley Rawl. And if you are navigating a faith deconstruction too, or are simply fascinated by faith deconstruction journeys, by Mormonism and religion generally, then you are in the right place. And I am joined today by the wonderful Andrew McKee. So wonderful. So wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had a nice little chat so far. <laughs> Andrew, you are an author, a life coach, and you have such a fascinating Mormon story. JC texted me, actually. Oh so Andrew is JC's dad. Many of you know JC Smith, who I've interviewed twice. And she was like, you've got to interview my dad. He has just so much to share. Right. And then I emailed you and you shared a little bit of your story and I've just been so looking forward to getting into it. Yeah, so let's go. Let's do it. Yeah. Before we jump into like your Mormon upbringing, mm-hmm. is there anything you would want to say about why you're wanting to talk about this, why you want to share your story, any like intentions? Yeah, so people suffer in this transition. Mm. It is a difficult thing, and I think the older you are, the more challenging it is. And we'll get into this as time goes by in this conversation, but the people that I work with, I have a podcast called People Who Suffer, Mm. and I help people who suffer have an experience of life that is less suffering. And when you understand what suffering is, why it's occurring then all of a sudden it becomes kind of an easy thing to have it dissipate, to have it become less. And inside of this realm, like faith deconstruction, there are very few things that cause as much mental pain and suffering as this. Yeah. And it becomes such a part of one's identity that you feel like when the curtain gets pulled back, you've lost yourself. What? And you're how old? I'm 20, almost 29. My birthday's in a few weeks. You are almost 29. Uh You look extraordinarily young. (laughs) JC says she gets that all the time too. JC looks extraordinarily young. She used to be really bothered by it. I don't know that she is anymore. Yeah. It's kind of a fun thing. I used to look young for my age until all of this stuff started rolling around. Mm. And then, um, yeah, so, so my real goal with this being here is to hopefully say some things that help your audience because I know it can be tough. There's a a way to approach it that's lighthearted and fun and, oh my gosh, isn't this ludicrous? I can't believe what I believed. But when you're alone and when you're with people who are believing and there's strain on relationships, there's difficult things to navigate that can really cause challenges for people. Yeah, and absolutely. I can, I can really help with that. I can't so that. wait. I can't wait to hear all your thoughts, all your wisdom. As we were talking before, I was saying that most people I have spoken to on the podcast have left earlier on mm-hmm. in life. I'm really excited to get into the experience of leaving a bit later, right. not only just to hear about how different that experience might be, but also because I can imagine you have a lot of wisdom that you think, oh, maybe those who have left younger could benefit from well, this. Well, I've clearly been around for a while. So. <laughs> and, and actually, that's one of the things that I, that I point out when I talk to people. I will speak occasionally to groups of young people. I work with a lot of young people. And to kind of break the ice at the beginning, I, I like to point out, here you are looking at me. You can clearly see that I'm not in your demographic. I'm a 54-year-old man. You're a 28-year-old woman, and it would be natural for it to occur to younger people to look and go, like, why is this guy talking? Why would I listen to him? I look the way I look because I arrived for this experience we call life at a different time. I got here earlier. That's it. So all of us show up. We have this experience for a period of time, and then it's done, And I got here a little bit earlier, and because of that, you can tell. But beyond that, we're not very different. The stuff that lives inside of us is not very different. It's it's actually kind of the same. And so if we can get past the things that get in the way of us seeing, we can hear truth all over the place. I don't really limit myself to any, any demographic. I'm 
I love that. All over the place. I love that perspective. As you were just talking, I was actually thinking about one of the things that I feel like I miss about Mormonism is I think it does a really good job of kind of creating connections between youth and adults. And I think there's obviously, you know, with the young women's program, the young men's program, even just going to Relief Society or Elders Quorum, you're interacting a lot of times with people outside of your demographic in Mm -hmm. ways that I think are really, really useful. And I have found actually in leaving that my interactions that way are much more limited. I'm much more insulated in my own demographic, Mm -hmm. which I think the work that you do, that's such a powerful piece of it because I think we miss out on so much on both ends, right? Right. If we're limiting ourselves and insulating ourselves in our own demographic. So I love that as a beginning note. Thank you. Let's jump into your upbringing. If you can just kind of paint a picture for us of what your Mormon upbringing was like. Oh, man. So I come from a little town in Canada called Trenton. It's about an hour and a half outside of Toronto, which is a huge metropolitan area. About 4 million people there, but there were only 15,000 people in my little town. My parents joined the church when they were really young. My mom, I think, was 16. My dad was 22. I think it was a prerequisite for her at that point that he had to join the church before their relationship mm-hmm. could go any further. So he did. They were kind of the beginnings of Mormonism in that part of the world. Oh, wow. Like they started with, with nothing and they had a few friends and a few couples that joined the church and there were, you know, 10, 12 of them. And then there were 15, 20. And by the time I was born, that was 1970, it had grown into a pretty thriving little crew there and nice little ward and and my family honestly was kind of the centerpiece of the ward wow yeah my parents are really great people very committed and they were also extremely pious like they were all in 100 percent in i honestly when i was a teenager i read mormon doctrine for fun just it intrigued you I wanted to know everything there was to know. I wanted to know the answer to every question. And that was one of the great things about Mormonism, is that Mormonism had answers to everything. Everything. (laughs) There wasn't just 17 points of the true church. There was every single question you could come up with, there was an answer to. And I see it very differently now in the information age, interestingly enough. But back then, I wanted to know every one of those answers. So Bruce R. McConkie was a big deal to me. And Mormon Doctrine was like an 800-page volume of just truth to wow. me. Wow, yeah. And I read it constantly. Uh, like I said, I've read the Book of Mormon 30, 31, 32 times. I've read most of the, the canon of, of great Mormon books many of which have been disavowed at this point. Yeah, interesting. Like Mormon doctrine itself. Yeah. And so my Mormon upbringing was was that I had crafted both through my family's influence, through the way the Mormons lived there. We were a small, tight-knit community. We had to really bond together. We did so many things that were fun. Oh, I bet. Oh, my gosh. We were like the Amish. Like It was all revolving around that community. 100% of my life experience was Mormon. Every thought I had ran through the filter of what I should do, what I shouldn't do, how I should think, how I shouldn't think. I remember when I was probably 10 years old, walking around in my backyard, trying to trick God by turning and walking another direction. Because I knew that he knew everything that was going to happen, and he knew every decision, every thought I was going to have. And so I started really young, really trying to deal with that. Yeah, sounds like it was... It was a little intrusive. Yeah, sounds like it. I think about that a lot with the psychology of just children, just being a child anyway, and kind of the weird things that we think as we're developing and then adding the layer on of this very, very intense, very literal belief Mm. in God and, you know, lots of Mormon doctrine and how when those things collide, it can do very interesting things to a childhood brain, especially. Yeah. And there's, there's this little thing called cognitive dissonance. And people think of cognitive dissonance as something that doesn't make sense in your mind. 
But I like to take that a step further. What cognitive dissonance is, it's the feeling of beliefs that are conflicting with your inner knowing. Mm. Your inner knowing knows that something's off. And so you get stuck in this off feeling, but you have to somehow continue to hold on to that belief because everything external to you is telling you that you have to. It was a lot of pressure to put on us as kids. And God bless my parents, they didn't know any different. Mm -hmm. They were doing the best they could with what they knew. Yeah. And I actually love them for it. Mm. I don't hold anything against them. I have no bitterness. I have no upset. There was a time when I did, but when I came to understand how and why they did the things they did and how they saw the world, it all just dissolved. Ooh, I'm excited to get more into that post-faith transition because I do know that that's something that a lot of people wrestle with, right? And not even that... In my experience, I think a lot of people who do leave Mormonism, there's this wrestle of, I love my parents. I know they were doing what they thought was best at the time, Mm -hmm. but also struggling to separate the harm that even what was best at the time for them still caused, right? Which is now very interesting being a parent myself Uh because Mormonism aside, it's given me obviously such a different perspective when I look at my kids and I think, I'm inevitably not going to be doing this perfectly, no. but I'm trying so hard. So hard. <laughs> so hard. So hard. And so were they. Yeah, exactly. They really were. Exactly. And, and you know, I always say this to people because one of the stages of, of transition, supposedly, mm. like there's stages of it. Mm-hmm. I don't really subscribe to the idea that there's stages. I think that understanding can have you jump the boundaries of time Mm. so that you don't have to go through all these stages. It doesn't have to take years. It doesn't have to be painful. It doesn't have to ruin your relationships. Like all of this stuff is unnecessary and I get why we think it is. I think the world of psychology kind of tells us that it is Mm. and we have to process and all of that because every parent on the planet is trying based on what they think to raise their children to believe the same things that they believe. Because they really think what they believe is true. Yeah. They really do. Yeah. And we all do, too. Yeah. Yeah. And there's varying degrees of those beliefs and the harm they can cause. But, yes. yes. We just happened to grow up in one that had so many beliefs that it was really unbelievable. Yes. A very high demand, very intense one. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you're talking about that cognitive dissonance thing. In your upbringing, you are very devout. You're doing all the things. You're reading Doctrine for Fun. Was there any of that cognitive dissonance happening for you at any point? Gosh, there was. There was actually lots of it. And I had to just set it aside. Mm -hmm. I had to just live with it. Like, I really thought that since this was his work and his glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man, that I would see evidence that that was occurring. Like that I would see that happening, that I would see the stone cut without hands rolling down the hill to fill the whole earth. And I know a lot of the people that probably listened to this might not even know the references that Mm. I'm giving, but these were the ones I grew up with. When when Mormonism was rolling along pretty well. Yeah, these were the prophecies. And we really thought that it was going to fill the whole earth. Well, it hasn't. And I noticed that it wasn't going well when I was a kid. Like, why are more people not interested in this? If this is the only way to get back, why is God so bad at his job? Uh (laughs) You know what? That's so interesting because I grew up in Provo. Mm -hmm. So that did not occur to me at all. It looked like he was doing a great job. Everybody I knew, it was thriving. Mm -hmm. It it was kind of the opposite of what you're saying. It's like all these smart and successful people, everyone was Mormon. Right. And then I got on my mission to Berlin, Germany. Oh my gosh. And that's the first time that that hit me of, wait a second, Mm -hmm. this system is incredibly inefficient. I'm feeling the inefficiency as people are yelling at me to get off their porch. And it wasn't (laughs) until that stage that I, that I kind of that clicked for me, but Uh, I'm, I'm sure growing up elsewhere where it's that missionary focus, you're seeing that much earlier on. I mean, I don't know how many, how many members of the church there were in my school. It wasn't many. And really for me, it wasn't any, because I didn't hang out with it. There were, you know, three or four that went to the same high school I went to. But I didn't see them. Mm-hmm. 
and none of my friends were members. It just, it just wasn't growing there. And I looked at their lives and I'm like, they're doing really well. They don't need what I have. So I kind of established that early in life that, okay, maybe, maybe later on, maybe in the millennium, they'll come around to it and that'll be great. But right now, why would anyone disrupt their lives? Mm -hmm. Their lives are really good, maybe even better than mine. And so I, I served a mission in Denmark. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, it was probably a little bit similar to Berlin, Germany, only less communist influence. So you mm -hmm. probably saw some things that I didn't see. But what I noticed about the Danes is that they were extraordinarily happy. They didn't need anything more in their lives. And I honestly, I mean, this is a big confession, but I didn't, I didn't try that hard. I loved my mission. And I did all the things I was supposed to do, but I didn't try to convince anyone that they needed to change. If they didn't come to me, we weren't having the conversation. So did you end up teaching a lot of people or what was... Funny enough, I did baptize a few people, which is rare yeah. for Denmark. I taught a lot of people. And I think part of the reason that I taught a lot of people is because I didn't, I didn't try to push it on them. Uh-huh. I think people can sense that yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. They if, asked me. Yeah. If you lack that the kind of desperation and the pushiness, <laughs> <laughs> which many a missionary have. <laughs> it's so funny. It's one of the first things I tell people when they're uh, like, you want to be at your highest level of self-esteem if you're seeking a relationship. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to be coming from desperation for anything. Yeah. Other people can feel it. Yeah, like totally. Like dogs sense fear. People sense desperation. It's not a good feeling. Yeah. So anyway, it, if, if we shift back for a second to my upbringing, my family had lots of problems. The one of them I'll share was, was really traumatic and devastating. And it was that my brother was killed in a car accident when I was eight. Wow. And he was 17. And my, my sisters were 15 and 13 at the time. And it was, man, you talk about, until you've experienced the death of a family member, an unexpected death of a family member, it's impossible to comprehend. It is horrific. And he wasn't living at the time according to the teachings of the gospel. And we were all in terror. And we didn't talk about it. And I remember, my gosh, I just remember being so terrified for him. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a really good cry with my first mission companion about it. And it was the first time I'd really had an open conversation with anyone about it. And I think I needed that separation because I had learned when I was young not to talk, not to talk about anything that I was struggling with, not to talk about anything that could possibly be violating, you know, me living up to the appearance that I needed to live up to, the image that I needed to live up to of being a good Mormon. Yeah. And so I had a, I had a conversation with him and he helped me. He's like, it'll all be fine. It, it'll all work out. And I think, you know, momentarily that brought me some relief, but I still stayed in that. Yeah. Like, as long as I held on to how I had interpreted those beliefs, there was no way he was making it. Mm, wow. Death is such an interesting piece of that puzzle. I, I want to get more into that, too, because I was with friends at dinner last night, and my dad passed away in December at 54, actually. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Thanks. Thank you. And that was my first, that has been my first real experience with death. And it has been so life altering, yeah. brain paradigm shifting. And I was talking to my friends last night and they lost a child. Oh my gosh. I know. And we were talking about how that was such a huge piece of it's kind of this thing, right, of you can believe something and then when the beliefs really become really, really, really real. When it gets tested. Yes. And yeah. I think death is kind of that ultimate thing, especially to your point, the death of somebody you love so much, a close family member. And I think it's kind of twofold what I'm trying to say, which is that I think that there's 
that thing where beliefs become, it's kind of like rubber hits the road, right? Yeah. But I think there's also this thing that I've been reflecting on a lot since my dad died of, I didn't ever really comprehend death. Even I, I was out of the church at that point. I feel like I had come to peace with a lot of things in my journey, but actually confronting death and its permanence yeah. is such a big thing. I can't imagine being a child and what that would feel like to be reckoning with something so gigantic and significant as death as a child. Yeah. And um, I'm feeling a lot of compassion for you right now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm 54. Yeah. And I remember walking into his room and he wasn't in it. And yet the circumstances around it being so not in line with how things were supposed to be mm -hmm. that I couldn't, I couldn't talk to anybody about my fear for him about that stuff. And I just remember spending hours walking around in the backfield and the woods by myself. Anyway, I didn't know we would go here today. Yeah. You know, this is <laughs> probably a little different than most of the conversations that mm. you have on here, but I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I do. I mean, yeah, there's, there's obviously so much there and I'm curious how this will come back around for you too, because I think that I do think with my dad passing the one thing, and this maybe kind of ties into your original point about suffering is that I feel really grateful that it feels that I don't have all of these mechanisms kicking in of the church answers it's actually felt really, although I think it maybe is harder for it in some ways, it feels much more real. And I feel like the processing has been very hard and very sad, but I have been really grateful that I don't have these mechanisms kicking in of like, but it's fine though, or like, it's all going to be okay. Or like, because this and that, or, you know, let me revisit the books to see like how right. this can all work out. I, I've, had a much more internal processing. And I think I have felt allowed to do that because of where I sit now, as opposed to where I was. Right. And yeah, I guess I just think that although there's many, many times where I think, man, I wish I just believed in something that I knew what would happen. And then I could just know it also feels like it even honors maybe his death more to reckon with it on this what I feel like is a deeper level than maybe I would have been able to otherwise. Yeah. I feel like this was maybe scheduled for a little later in the conversation, but mm. maybe not a bad idea to go into. Yeah. Let's do right it now. Yeah. I saw it for, you know, a lot of years of my life trying to feel better because I could not in any way live up to the beliefs that I held about how I needed to be. Mm. Couldn't do it. And I had to pretend. And I think that's what a lot of us have to do that created a, a lot of difficulty for me. And we were on vacation in Canada in 2006. And I got really sick and I had weird physical symptoms. And we were on the day we were flying home. When we landed in Phoenix, I called my doctor who also happened to be my bishop. Oh, wow. And I had a great relationship with him. So it wasn't weird for me to call him at 11 o'clock at night. And I called him and, and told him I was having strange physical symptoms. I didn't feel great. He said, do you, you need to go to the emergency room now? And I'm like, no, I don't think so. He said, well, come to my office first thing in the morning. I'm going to do some reading on your symptoms and see what I can come up with. Jill and I went to his office in the morning. She drove, which is like the first time in our married life that she drove because I was having such muscle weakness mm. that I couldn't pick anything up. I couldn't, I was having a hard time walking. And uh, he had all his medical journals out on the desk and he said, well, it could be this, 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 and this. And they, they were all not good. And as soon as he could, he got in touch with his friend who ran the Barrows Neurological Institute, which is a major hospital in Phoenix, and told him my symptoms. And that guy said, put him in a car right now. We're going to fast track him into an observation room so we can see what's going on. Because I, I think he has something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is the paralysis of the autonomic nervous system. And it's pretty dangerous. Mm. And so they fast tracked me in there, hooked me up to all sorts of things, ran some tests. I was coming back negative on all my tests. I'd been there for a while, a couple hours maybe, and I'm sitting in bed and Jill was sitting at, at my bedside with me 
And I looked at her and I said, I don't feel good. And uh, I flatlined. Wow. She got to experience everything that was going on here. Mm -hmm. And I got to experience something else. And it was not what was going on here. And uh, I found myself, and I didn't share this with very many people in the beginning. Maybe, I'd maybe shared it with 100 people over the course of 10 years because I felt like it was one of those things that was too sacred to share. And I would only share it with people who'd lost loved ones. And it seemed to bring lots of comfort to them. I see it pretty differently now. I found myself, I had the sense of being in a meadow of waving grasses on top of a hill. And on the other side of the hill, I had the sense that all the family members, including my brother and my niece and my uncle, we had a lot of premature death in my family. I had a sense that they were all there. Mm. But not just them, also everyone else. And I had a sense that there wasn't a huge amount of difference in how well I knew them all. And that's cool. And it wasn't even remotely the coolest part of the experience. The coolest part of the experience was the feeling. And the feeling was so beautiful that it's incomprehensible to anything I had ever experienced here. And it filled up every bit of whatever space I occupied. And I woke up a couple minutes later just before they were hitting my chest with the paddles. And no one could explain why it happened, what had happened, why I woke up again, none of that. But it's really well documented because I was in the hospital when it happened. Yeah. And it took me a few minutes to, you know, recalibrate into this life. And I felt incredibly peaceful. And I felt so good. And I told my wife, I said, I, I don't know. I don't know where or what. All I could feel was love. It was the only word I could use. Hmm. And I thought, and then I went into my mind and tried to use the context of all my teachings to explain what had happened. And I thought what had happened is that I had died and gone to be in the presence of God because God is love. And because I was there, I got to feel that love. And when I came back, I could, I could remember it, but I couldn't be in it. Mm -hmm. And that immediately took away any sense of sadness from me about those who had passed on. I felt so, I don't know what the word is, so comforted around what they were experiencing. And I called my mom first and said, Mom, Grandma's fine. It's okay for us to miss her. Hmm. We don't need to worry about her. And it brought an enormous amount of comfort to the family and all the suffering that we'd been doing in the year since she had passed on it kind of went away with my experience. And then funny enough, I went, and you can imagine that that was a beautiful thing to happen to somebody who had been in suffering Absolutely. my whole life. Yeah, wow. And like serious mental suffering, mental suffering to the point where I, I didn't really want to be here a lot of the time. Mm. And um, which, <laughs> it's so funny. Um, when, when they do surveys about suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts, I remember there was one that came out of Utah one time, and it was talking about LGBTQ people in the church and how many of them had contemplated suicide. And I think this, the number came back at like 25% or 27%. To me, that was extraordinarily low. I didn't understand why everyone hadn't thought of getting out of a difficult experience. I, di I didn't understand why that didn't occur to everyone. Because it was so normal to you that you felt that way. So normal to me. My wife never thought about it ever. Mm -hmm. and, and I use this analogy, like if someone is punching you in the face, you want them to stop. Yeah, yep. <laughs> and if they won't stop, then you want to remove yourself from the situation where that person's punching you in the face. So if you feel like that person is life and it's punching you in the face and everything you try to do to get it to stop, it won't stop. You're like, huh, I, I gotta figure something else out. Yeah. So that puts into context the suffering that I had lived in up to the point I had this experience. And then I had this experience and I was like, whoa, that's what's coming. That's cool. I just have to endure to the end. I just gotta make it through. Because you were still believing Mormon at this point. I was, except that one thing didn't make sense to me when I came back from that. I'm like, well, Amulek was wrong. In the Book of Mormon, he says the same spirit that possesses your body here will have power to possess your body in the world to come. And I'm like, well, I just visited the world to come. 
And it didn't feel anything like this. You're a little off on your assessment. Yeah, that doesn't feel right. Yeah, doesn't jive. And that was the first time that I really had something that really made me go, huh. And it was two years later, and I had returned back into some pretty serious suffering, but it was two years later I was watching General Conference, which I took extraordinarily seriously. I watched every session. Yep. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid, we would dress up and go to the church. Oh, no. In our church clothes. <laughs> That's the one good thing about general conference is you can watch in your pajamas. Yeah, it was a shock to me. I came down here and everyone's having cinnamon buns. And <laughs> yeah, watching on the playing couch. Playing games and sitting on the couch and talking through. And I'm like, shh, shh I'm going to miss it. I'm going to uh-huh, miss something. Uh-huh. So anyway, so it comes to general conference in 2008. Jeffrey R. Holland gives a talk where he holds up the Book of Mormon that supposedly was the one that Hiram Smith had in Carthage jail on the night they were... They were shot. And he said a couple of things that he ought not to have said from the pulpit. I mean, if you just look at me as an example, he said, this book has been torn apart and dissected and all of this stuff. And no one has been able to assail it. Not the Tanners, not the Spaldings. And I'm like, who are the Tanners? Do you know who the Tanners are? Mm, mm-hmm. Well, now, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I know Gerald the talk you're talking Tanner. about. Yeah, and at that point, no. I didn't know when he said that. And I got right up from my chair and went down the hall and Googled Book of Mormon Tanners. And that's when it started for me. I remember that talk so vividly because they play that exact clip at the MTC. So I... They ought not to I, play I, Yes, I absolutely agree. But it's the one where he says, if anyone... There's something he says about... If you leave the church, you have to do it like over or under or like crawl through the Book of Mormon. It's that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. Yes. You know what? That is so interesting because for me, not only I didn't really know bells rung for me about the Tanners or the Spaldings, which he mentioned, but I do remember in my deconstruction thinking they made everything hinge on the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And they thought that that was to their benefit because they thought, if you believe the Book of Mormon, and I did this as a missionary, I would teach people, read the Book of Mormon, pray Mm -hmm. if it's true. If it is true, then Joseph Smith's a prophet. Then we have the one true church. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But that can be a very dangerous thing because then if you can disprove the Book of Mormon, then everything, you know, the inverse is also true. Then everything can also fall from there. Yeah, and if we go back to where you started with this and asking me a couple questions... That was the one thing that I did have questions about that didn't make sense to me. Like, I mean, I love the Jaredites, but their story didn't make any sense to me. How they were loaded in barges that flipped upside down and all this with animals in there and they stayed on the sea for a year. And and then the numbers didn't make sense. And actually in the first month of my mission with my companion, we created a big flow chart to try to figure out how these 30 people or however many there were could multiply into the millions Uh (laughs) in the amount of time they had Uh and then um and then shiz was a problem you know leaning up on his on his hands and gasping for breath and with no head Um, (laughs) i forgot about that and then and then the other one i mean there were just so many things and and the story of laban and nephi being compelled to murder Laban, which I was never down with, mm-hmm. never made sense to me. I'm like, he's a strong dude. This guy's drunk and asleep. Tie him up. You're still going to get out of town. You don't need to kill you him. I, mm-hmm. and, and how on earth did you get his clothes off after you cut his... I, there, were just, there were just things that didn't make sense to me. Yeah. So I would avoid certain parts of the Book of Mormon all the time. And hey... Let's face it, there are some things in there that are really inspiring. Yeah, that absolutely. Are really good. Yeah, really just beautifully written. Yes. Poetic. Yeah, I and agree. And then there's 525 pages of other things, uh-huh. which are not as much my favorite. I really kind of hope my mom doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> Sorry, mom. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and I know JC this is funny because JC reached out to me one day and she had been going through stuff in her head for a while. And I, I, I didn't fully understand why she didn't come to me earlier because it was obvious that I was I was the one in the family that was not mm-hmm. fully on board for a long, long time. Never made them do anything. If they wanted to go to mutual, great. If they didn't, you know, whatever. Yeah. I didn't care. Yeah. I think mom did a little bit more because she was trying to hang on. Yeah. After I had told her. 
So that talk, I listened to that talk in 2008. Yeah, let's go back there. For three years, every night, I was at my computer from the time everyone went to bed until two, three o'clock in the morning, reading everything I could possibly read to try to make sense of it. And it just, it, it just didn't add up. Can we talk about the tanners being, I'm curious where that thread kind of <laughs> led you, just to explain for listeners who don't okay. know how that so kind Sandra of... So and Gerald Tanner, Utah Lighthouse Ministry, they are actually, I mean, he's passed away, she's still here. I hung out with her actually a few months ago. Oh, that's nice, yeah. Spent an afternoon with her, talked about all sorts of stuff. I, uh, I went in and, and heard some of the things that they had said about things that didn't add up, things that didn't make sense. And they did it in good faith. They wanted things to work out because they really wanted to stay. And they ended up being forced out because they were bringing into the public domain things that the church really didn't want to have in the public domain. I had thought up until that point, everything that had ever been said that put the church in any sort of a bad light was made up by the anti-Mormons to try to thwart the work of God. As a matter of fact, and this is another big confession, on my mission, there were a couple of anti-Mormon books that had gotten some traction in Denmark, and we went around. (laughs) (laughs) Me and my companion made it our goal to find them all and steal them and burn them. Oh, wow. So this is what I did as a missionary. Wow. Burning that anti-Mormon literature. I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations (laughs) is up on that now. Um, but yeah, I stole I, I stole a bunch of books from libraries and bookstores, and my gosh, I I never stolen anything in my life. Wow! And I'm sneaking out with a backpack as a missionary. As a missionary, thinking it was the right thing to do. Thinking absolutely, I was serving the Lord. Mm-hmm. Wow! What a perfect example. I love how literal that is. Of what you're trained to do as yeah. a Mormon, right? Mm-hmm. You wouldn't think, well, I wonder what this says or what this could say or why someone would want to write a book to. Right. It's just, you know, mm-hmm. it's anti-Mormon because as you said so succinctly, people don't want the work of God to move forward because right. there's evil people. And so right. anything that contradicts, even not directly contradicts, but anything that adds some nuance or complexity mm-hmm. to the story right. is evil yeah. to the point of worthy of, burning the thing yeah and man did i feel like a a great person when i did it i felt terrible but but it was the fear of getting caught Uh but i i really felt like i was being protected on the way out of the bookstore yeah i don't want to sound like a lunatic (laughs) i I, mean i I, think (laughs) that tracks i think anyone listening is like yep i understand where that yeah where that impulse came from and so what we get trained to do is we get trained to believe unbelievable things. And when you're trained to believe unbelievable things, there's no limit to the things you can believe. And it's no wonder that conspiracy theories thrive more in this community than they do in well-educated agnostic communities, for example. Mm. They haven't been trained to believe things that are unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And, and once you stand back and subjectively look at things in a vacuum, you go, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. How did I ever think that that made any sense? I think I, that all the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I got really good at it. So Malcolm Gladwell in his book called The Tipping Point has created this idea that 10,000 hours makes you an expert on something. And there's probably some efficacy, some truth to that. Well, I spent way more than 10,000 hours believing things that were not believable. And and I think it goes back to what we started talking about is that the church felt like it needed to separate itself by having an answer to everything. And every answer that got added, they, they had no idea at the time that there was going to be uh, a time in history where we could fact check, mm-hmm. where science would advance to a point where it could say this didn't happen, where there would be recording devices, where there would be, you know, all of that stuff, it's it's all changed now. Yeah, that's that's such an interesting way to think about it too, because you think even in this age now of information where any believing Mormon could theoretically pick up their phone and Google something, that would probably throw a pretty big wrench in their beliefs that 
training, that conditioning is so deep. It's mm-hmm. so high stakes right. because everything depends on it that it works really well. And there's people who either don't want to seek out that information or also potentially no information, but find ways to make it work because that's their safety and their comfort. Yeah, I mean, you have to, and I understand them. I don't judge them one bit. Like I get why people want to stay. For sure. The community is fantastic. Meanwhile, I was having an extraordinarily difficult time connecting with the people that lived next door to me because we believed such drastically different things. And the undercurrent of all of it was that I felt better than everyone else because I felt like I had all the knowing that they needed. Yep. And so I walked around with this, oh, you poor people. If only you knew. If only you knew. That's one of the sadder parts. It is. It is. I want to talk about, you've talked about this suffering that you experienced throughout much of your life to Mm -hmm. the point of suicidal ideation. And I want to talk about if you can give us a little bit more of what that looked like and felt like for you. And then leading back up to that experience of unraveling. And then I want to talk about, it seems like you're in a much different place now, kind of reconstructing from there. I'm in a totally different place now, and I can point to a very specific series of awakenings that occurred to to have that happen. As a matter of fact, what I do now, I do because I I don't know how to not do it. Like, I don't really... You have to do it. I have to do Mm -hmm. it. And I wanted to do it before, and I couldn't do it then because I was a person who needed to know. I had to know. And if I didn't, that was the way I lived in the church. And so I got to the point where I knew all this stuff. And then I had to know why it wasn't accurate. So anyway, back to, you asked me about the suffering. I've described it in this way. Do you like roller coasters? Uh, Depends. (laughs) Okay. I love that it depends because it means that there's a part of you that really doesn't like them. Mm -hmm. And when you're tick, 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 going up, you know that knot that you get in your mm-hmm. stomach, that terror mm-hmm. of what's about to come? I had that all the time. Ugh. I can relate to that in a very small sense, but that's how I explained my mission. I said I woke up every morning with a giant knot in my stomach yeah. of this, I have to live this day. I have to do it. And I so badly don't want to. And I don't want to do it under these circumstances. And I don't want to go out and have to talk to these people and have them yell at me. It was kind of that feeling. Yeah. But wow, yeah, experiencing that for so long. Yeah. I felt like everything I did was wrong, that I was constantly going to be found out. When you have this standard that is so high that you've invested, that I had invested so much time in knowing. Like I wasn't just your your average Mormon. I memorized the Articles of Faith when I was 10, perfectly. I knew people who couldn't do them when they were trying to graduate from seminary. I knew every scripture in Scripture Chase. I knew it all. And when I was in the MTC, <laughs> the people uh, that I had in my district, only one of them had ever read the Book of Mormon. <laughs> I'm like, what are these people doing? (laughs) Yeah, like what? (laughs) They were all from the Mormon corridor, right? Uh They were all from Idaho, Utah, Arizona. They were just there because that's what you do. Mm -hmm. And I was there because I had prepared the daylights out of my life for that. Again, don't don't think I was a lunatic. I wasn't, but but you wanted to do it right, and I wanted to do it right. They thought I was a plant. Mm. They thought I was a spy in there to make to keep them in check (laughs) yeah those guys are probably like who is this guy (laughs) and it it, it took it took me quoting you know reciting the whole monty python and the holy grail to them one night (laughs) for them to realize that i'm just a A regular guy a regular person yeah yeah i always this is something a theme that i've kind of recognized as i've interviewed people of There's so many ways, obviously, to relate to Mormonism and to be a Mormon. But I think it's very easy to look at people who took it very, very literally and Mm. say, well, they just took it too literally. Mm. That is what the church wanted you to do. You were doing it more true to what was asked of you than anybody else. Yeah. You know? And to me, I think, especially with you talking about this suffering, it just goes to show that even if you're not doing it to that extent, every Mormon, or I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I think many of us as Mormons, regardless of where on the spectrum of orthodoxy we fell or zealousness, 
we are still living in the shadow to your point of, I know I should be here. Yeah. Yeah. I know I should be here. And whether you're like really trying for that or you've kind of given up, you still have this little bit of you that feels like I'm not doing it completely right. I'm not totally there. I always could be reading my scriptures more. I always could be praying more. I could believe more. And you feel these personal failures all the time because it feels impossible to ever live the standard all day, every day. And, and, and my definition of suffering, and it's not, I didn't come up with it. I don't know who I got it from, but it's having an experience different from the one we think we should be having. And the more rigid our ideas, the more complex the vision of the experience we think we should be having, the more suffering. Ooh. And so as you add every belief you add to your identity, and your identity is nothing other than a huge collection of beliefs that have, that started when you were born, when you didn't have any, and then they got added to you and stored in your brain over time. And, you know, we've got subconscious and conscious beliefs, and they come from everywhere. And the more we have, and the better we are at recalling them, the more we're going to suffer. And so when you belong to an organization that has so many beliefs and you memorize them, then nothing in your physical world is aligning with how you think things should be. Wow, yeah. So you're going to suffer. Yeah. And when you see that suffering for what it is, and when you see belief for what it is made up, then it falls away really easily. And you start with one belief, and this is how a lot of people go into deconstruction, but then they focus their deconstruction just on this one thing, Mormonism. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that they're carrying all these beliefs about other things that are causing them suffering in other areas of their lives. Mm. And you could take the example of what you've done here and do it all over the place. And the fear that people have is they're going to lose who they are. And if you're really attached to the idea of who you are, that's frightening and painful. But when you realize that the idea of who you are is not who you are, that there's something inside you, there's something different, there's a different source of experience. There's the thing that was driving the experience I had when I wasn't alive. And that's why I never refer to them as near-death experiences, because near-death experiences don't teach you If you only come near death, it Mm. doesn't teach you that there's another source of experience. Brief death is a different thing. Because when you're briefly dead, your physical is not providing your experience. Your spiritual is. I have so many thoughts. I want to get into the awakenings and kind of that reconstruction, which I think we're kind of getting into. One thing I want to point out is that I'm really glad you defined suffering. Because I think that's an important thing to define. Because I feel like, let's take my dad's death again for example i think sometimes in certain like certain books or certain probably coaching spheres as well there feels like what i can probably reductively but most easily describe as like toxic positivity right like yeah. let me teach you how to be happy yeah. let me teach you how to like buck up and get through it and be okay no matter what and i love what you said about suffering because looking at my experience with my dad dying I think it was sadder and harder than it maybe would have been otherwise as I spoke to. But I also think that that level of suffering you're talking about, that's what I was trying to say wasn't there because I wasn't expecting to have his death mean a certain thing to me, if that's making sense. And so I've been able to not avoid sadness, devastation, even hopelessness and despair. But I've allowed myself to do that without thinking like I'm a bad person because I feel that way. And I think that's a really cool way of thinking about things because, yeah, it doesn't mean you're going to avoid feeling the whole spectrum of emotions. But there's a different it almost sounds like and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong in 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 what you're talking about here, but it feels like what you're saying is it's more so like a perspective on how we allow ourselves to even just move through life without all of these metrics and rules and beliefs, as you say. Yeah. So toxic positivity. There's nothing that drives me more nuts than people getting caught in the misery of trying to be positive (laughs) when it feels like a lie. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And it feels like a lie because it is. And uh, I've said this so many times that it, it isn't the presence of positive thought that helps us enjoy our experience of life. It's the absence of negative thought. Mm. Far more powerful. Mm. The absence of negative. Why? Well, the Buddha summed this up pretty well when he said that the greatest state a human can achieve is the state of no thought. Because when you are not thinking from your, your brain, you're just in awe. You're in wonder. You're in observation. You're in awareness. Um, funny enough, awareness is what and who you are inside of this physical thing. And no matter what happens, like I got a, I sustained a pretty severe concussion five months ago when I injured my shoulder and ran full speed into a brick wall, which I don't recommend doing. I was, yeah, I was wow. playing basketball at the mm. time. And my brain has functioned a little differently since then. And when I'm doing things that require my brain, I do them a little differently. But when my brain is silent, I feel the same as I did before. You know the story of the little engine that could? Mm-hmm. Okay, it's a really good story, and it's fun to tell, but it's really misleading. Because what it does is the little engine that could gets, you know, this responsibility has to take over and pull this load up over this hill. And at first, he's got loads of doubt. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I can do that. And then as time goes on, oh, I think I can. And then he starts doing it. Oh, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I know I can. Was there ever a time when he couldn't? Not actually. No. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to ruin the story of the little engine that could and make it into a very uneventful thing, give the little engine the responsibility to take that thing over the hill and it looks at it and it knows that it can do it and it does it. Oh, of course. I've done it. Done. Yeah. <laughs> There's the story. Really boring. Yeah. You know, but it also doesn't get us into this realm of having to overcome negative thinking with positive thinking. It helps us to see that if we could just see things as they are, we either can or we can't. Can I fly? No. Can I travel in an airplane? Yes. You're not going to think yourself into being able to I fly. Can't, yeah. I can't <laughs> think I can think I can into flying. Mm -hmm. I can't think myself into doing something I'm not capable of doing. Mm -hmm. I can't be Michael Jordan. But I can really enjoy playing basketball when my mind is silent and I'm not judging myself or comparing myself. And that all comes from this big conflicting protest that goes on in our heads of thinking things should be one way and then the protest on the other side saying, but they're not, but they're not. And then we get into this big fight and it feels terrible because then we find ourselves in extreme busyness of mind that covers the experience of what lies within us. Mm -hmm. And so I love the way you've approached this thing, which we're meaning-making creatures. We have a desire to make meaning of things, but we don't have to. Yeah, my brother was killed in a car accident. I got 17 years, well, I got eight years with him. The family got 17 with him. There's been 112 billion people live on this planet. There's only eight billion of us now. 104 billion have come and gone. They've had their experience. They showed up earlier than we did, and, and now they're gone. I don't have fear about what's coming. And the reason I don't have fear about what's coming is because, well, for one part, I got to try it out for a second, mm -hmm. which is a, a rare experience, but not as rare as some might think. But the other reason is I don't put all of my happiness outside me. And this is really the greatest challenge with, I mean, we're here talking about Mormonism. We could be talking about any other thing. Like I had friends who were Jehovah's Witnesses, Worldwide Church of God, all these other really, really strict and committed organizations. We could be talking about those. And the thing that they all have in common is they put happiness outside you. They put your salvation outside you. They put your meaning for life outside you. They make you dependent on things outside you to determine whether or not you're having a good life. And then people get caught up in this, yeah, but if we let go of all those directives outside of us, then how do we live like good people? It's the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. 
this yep. thing inside of every human walking this planet that if we would quiet our minds down, we would find ourselves in this space of knowing and understanding. And interestingly enough, it's got a lot of other names too. Love, wisdom, insight, healing, clarity, energy, awareness, consciousness, patience, gratitude. All of those things are expressions of what lives inside of us. And when we know that, when we connect with that, then we look at this other thing that up until now caused us suffering, we see it for what it is, and we go, oh, of course, and that's it. Yeah, I'm thinking this is perhaps a bit cliche, but I'm thinking of the, I don't know if this is a quote from someone, it's something I encountered a little bit ago, but it said that religion takes something that you already have and then sells it back to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what you're saying, right? And I think that's the beautiful thing for so many of us about deconstructing, though difficult to sometimes relearn that mm -hmm. or to actually internalize that, even if we rationally come to that understanding, is realizing we used all these words of Holy Ghost and mm. God and the atonement and saving and salvation and all these things, but realizing, oh, that's been here all along all along we're walking sitting on the couch with us yeah right now yep and no one could take that from us can't they can't it goes everywhere you go yeah i i think that's such a beautiful beautiful thing and yeah i think that describes so well again what is so freeing <laughs> about so deconstructing freeing. yeah and i love that word the use of that word and i feel so much compassion for people who are resistant to it and, it's, and, and they don't have to. They don't have to deconstruct. They can stay. It's great. I don't, I don't actually try to disrupt anyone's belief. But when people come to me, I ask them, like, how deep do you want to go into this conversation? I have, for example, I've, I've worked with many people. Here's the one thing I know. When someone comes to me, I know this about them. I know they're in suffering. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the chair. And I have this spectrum of feeling that I draw. And on one end is the worst you can possibly feel. And on the other end is the best you can possibly feel. And a spectrum by its nature encompasses all of something. So there's no feeling that doesn't exist on this spectrum. And what I know about every person who comes to me is that they're at least left of center. And so many of them are in this space where something isn't making sense, doesn't feel right, I can't live like this anymore, I can't, and, and especially like the younger you are, the more life you have to look forward to. And you're like, am I going to do this mm. for the next 60 years? We didn't consider that when we were kids. People ask me, you know, when I moved to Arizona, people used to ask me, well, why do you live there? And I said, because I can. And it doesn't occur to people to do things that they can. So that question of, do I want to live like this for the next 60 years, wasn't a question that anyone in my generation asked. It wasn't a natural question. Yeah. We were what we were, mm -hmm. and that was just how it was. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a lot of choice in life. We had to have jobs. We couldn't be podcasters. Yeah. We couldn't, we couldn't do any of the stuff that technology has created. Everyone in your demographic and, and, and younger is asking themselves these questions now. And they're like, well, do I want to live like this for the rest of my life? And if I don't, what do I do? And then comes the suffering. And so many of the people I work with come to me because they're caught in this suffering where the parents are hanging on so tightly. And it's destroying the relationships with the children needlessly. So unnecessary, yeah. So unnecessary. And what's available is for them both to understand each other from the understanding they are. And when you understand them, the suffering goes away. And guess what? Your relationship becomes beautiful again, regardless of what beliefs you're holding on to on Sunday. And people just don't know that. Yeah. Well, and I think it's really hard to get there. I mean, this is my next question. And... I, it's a gigantic question. But the question, I guess, is how 
do get there. And I'm sure that, you know, that's not easily so easy to sum up or I think you have summed it up in some ways, but I guess I'm asking from a practical standpoint, if there's a listener listening and they want that, they can kind of feel themselves like, oh, that feels resonant. I want that. Do you have any practical strategies and perhaps even from your experience of rebuilding and reawakening, as you put it, how did you get from that suffering deconstructing to where you are now? So I had a really powerful experience while I was just still in the in my office. And in the stillness, my mind got even more still. I'm so still that my beliefs fell off me, like in a visual way. Wow. I saw them on the floor. You'll never be successful. You're not a good dad. You're this, you're that. There were some good beliefs too, but they all fell away. And in the moment that occurred, and I don't know how long it lasted. It might have lasted five seconds. It might have lasted a minute. I don't know. But I'm sitting in the basement and I'm feeling this feeling. And it was incredible. And it filled up every bit of the space I occupied. And I'm like, I felt this before, but I was briefly not alive when I felt this. What is it? And I just allowed that question to kind of be present in whatever was still there of my mind. What is this beautiful feeling? And the feeling said, I'm you. I'm you. This is who we are. And you just spoke to it so well when you said, we, we put it outside of us. We took this beautiful thing inside of us and put it outside of us and then made it only reachable upon conditions of worthiness, which had us living in constant thinking of shame and guilt and just all of this stuff that ruins your experience of life and makes it frightening and no fun. Doesn't mean you're never going to suffer but it's not necessary for that to be the foundation of life. I thought and was 100% convinced that life was built on a foundation of suffering that we had to endure to the end. We just got to make it, man. That's it. Mm -hmm. And when we make it, then there's the reward. Well, why would God do that? Why would a God who has all power say, I'm going to create you and you're not allowed to feel good until you're done being my creation. And I'm going to test you intentionally. Yeah. And you can't succeed. You're going to fail. Mm. And so I'm going to give you this thing that will make up for all your failures. But even then you don't get your reward until it's all over. No. No, that's one of the things I was actually, we were talking about the same line of thought last night with those friends at dinner when you were talking about death as well and just thinking about how I think that's sometimes the final kind of crux deconstruction piece is reimagining God and thinking, wait, if this is the all-knowing, all-powerful being, why would they be this way? <laughs> Why would they not be just love, as you've said? No. And I think that obviously our image and our understanding of God is so reflective of our image and our understanding of ourselves. Yeah. And so you think if this is the God that I was taught to worship and think was God, it makes sense as well how then we internalize those messages yeah. about ourselves. And... Yeah, I just think that that's so powerful. I really, really appreciate the way that you framed so many of these things has been hugely beneficial to me. So thank you. I appreciate all that you've shared. And yeah, I think it's... We, we are, must be coming to the end. <laughs> I know, we I are. I know what time I is. know. Let's see. We've gone one hour and 20 minutes. Can you believe it? Wow. <laughs> I know. Time flies. Wow. I... Yes, I'm curious if you have any parting notes before we go, but I just want to thank you. And I, I want to kind of bring it back around, actually, interestingly enough, to the age thing that we started talking about, because I just really appreciate being able to have a conversation as peers. I think that's something a little bit I mentioned. I think Mormonism does a good job at this in some ways, but I it's been interesting, actually, as I was preparing for my interview with you, I had some of these things come up of like, male authority figure older than me smarter than me and just like some insecurity around that and I just really appreciate being treated like a peer and being spoken to like a peer and I think that yeah there's just so much that everyone can learn from everybody else but I'm just 
I guess I'm just trying to say I'm very grateful that you're willing to come share your time wow. and your wisdom with, with me and with anyone listening to. I, I love that. I love that acknowledgement. I love that you noticed that. I really don't see age. I really don't see, I don't think I'm smarter than you. I don't think I know more than you. I don't think I have more access than you. I don't think I'm wiser than you. I just happen to have been here longer. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of things that I've experienced that put me in a place where I can share with someone who hasn't experienced that yet. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I have no authority. Neither does anyone else. I know. Yeah. That's a hard one to crack for me, but yes. Yeah. They just, they just don't. And, and I love them for what they're doing. I love them for trying. I love them for being there for support. I've had really interesting conversations with my own bishops. And after I woke up to who I am and experienced the difference between who I am and who I had always thought I was, that was one of the first things that just evaporated. Not one sense of anything as I walked into a room had me feeling that someone had authority over me. Mm, it's powerful. And I don't, and I don't care that they do or don't. One last story before we please, go. yeah, please. In this conversation with one of my bishops, we were talking about tithing, and I had said I just don't feel comfortable writing a check to, uh, you know, an organization that's run by old white guys, and them determining where my charity goes, mm -hmm. and then me feeling good about it, mm -hmm. like I've done my bit. And I said, I, I and I said, why are we in here? for this thing called tithing settlement in the first place. And he said, well, it's the easiest commandment to measure and keep. And I said, no, it's not. And he said, what do you mean? I said, do you want to hear the easiest commandment to measure and keep? He said, sure. I said, see that tree over there? It's got some fruit on it. Don't eat it. And what were they supposed to do? If this story is the true story, what were they supposed to do? I don't think it is the true story, but since it's been set up as a story, mm -hmm. let's see it for what it is. And he was like, well, yeah. And I said, it kind of makes you wonder which of all the other commandments you're supposed to not keep. And he sat back in his chair and went, huh. And I said, let me make it easy for you. All of them. We're supposed to not keep all of them. Do you know how I know? because none of us has any idea what the commandments actually are. Mm -hmm. And therefore, none of us keeps any commandments. Mm -hmm. And the atonement, if there is such a thing, is like air. You breathe it. You walk around and breathe it, and it just is. You don't have to go find it. You don't have to seek it out. You don't have to be worthy of it. It just is. And that was a conversation that could not be had by me if I had felt that he was an authority figure yeah. over me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was so, like you used the word freeing. It was so freeing. And that little conversation I've had with a number of people, and they've all kind of done the same thing. Huh. I never heard it like that before. It gives you some freedom even if you're trying, even if you're still hanging on great and you're trying to keep the commandments, have infinite grace for yourself because we're all doing the best with what we know mm -hmm. in any given situation. Just like today, we've had this conversation and we've done the best that we could today in this conversation. There's some things we said that we could have said differently. There's some things we didn't say that would have been nice to say, but it doesn't matter. I extra love that as a parting note because I think that's one of my biggest mental battles now since starting this podcast is just wanting to do it right <laughs> you know and I think the way you said that was really helpful for me just to realize like what even is right you know and yeah. there's going to be some things that you say that might feel hurtful for one person but feel really enlightening for another person and just I'm on my own journey of 
letting go of that. It's like a perfectionism. It's a need to be right, whether that's right. It used to be in the church and now there's different forms of rightness, whether that's political correctness or X, Y, and Z. And I really appreciate that because I think it's a really fulfilling thing to feel like I got on a mic and I tried to do my best to have a conversation and I hope that it helps other people, but then let it be. And you're, you're doing amazing as I think most of us are, but really in something like this that opens you up to the very thing that people fear mm. more than anything else, which is harsh judgment from others. Mm. I, 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 you're inspirational. Like it's, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate that. I cannot thank you enough. This was so lovely. And I say this a lot too, but I love doing a podcast because the reason I wanted to start a podcast is because I love having conversations like this. And then it feels so special to feel like oh, now we get to have this conversation so much more widely and more broadly by recording it. So yeah. I'm just really grateful. Thank you again. I will add to my show notes where people can find you, your website, Perfect. your social media, all those things. And so they can go get more of your wisdom. But thank you so much, Andrew. I so appreciate it. Thank you, Haley. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Bye. Bye. G I R L S C A M P S Girls Camp. This has been a 58 Ember production. For more shows, please visit the 58 Ember channel, 58ember.com or find us at 58 Ember Media on socials.